Chapter 5. Can Cusay Scam? Cusay purchased the custodianship of the Kaaba for a skin full of wine and a loot. Desolate is the best word to describe Arabia in the years before the Prophet's birth. Although civilization made its debut along the only portion of Arabia that doesn't touch the sea, for thirty-five centuries it failed to take root in the desert sands. In the east lay Mesopotamia, the fertile land between the Tigris and Euphrates. Its legendary cities invented the tool that binds you and me, reader and writer, man's greatest achievement, written language. Nearly five thousand years ago, the Sumerians, Babylonians, and Assyrians used cuneiform to proclaim their achievements in science, math, astronomy, law, medicine, agriculture, architecture, the arts, and religion. While these advances were occurring, Arabia remained isolated and stagnant, providing the culture necessary to propagate Islam. Poverty in proximity to greatness makes a people vulnerable to deceit. While we stand upon the shoulders of the Babylonian, Assyrian, and Sumerian scholars, we are haunted by their faith. Two politically-minded doctrines grew out of its schemes, medieval Catholicism and fundamental Islam. For a thousand years, the most powerful forces on earth were not nations, but religions. Both deployed rites first practiced in Babylonian temples. Many Catholic symbols, festivals, and doctrines are rooted in the practice of these distant peoples. Christmas, Easter, Lent, the priesthood, confession, and the worship of the Virgin Mary are examples of present rites borrowed from a pagan past. Islam was not immune. Allah was Sin, the moon god of Ur. The Quranic paradise and hell were imported from the same realm. The cuneiform indentations in clay that confirm these startling realities became hieroglyphics along the Nile, and an alphabet on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean. We know from the temple writings in Karnak that pagan gods like those in the Fertile Crescent flourished in Egypt. We saw them emerge again in Greece, then Rome. Yet in Canaan it was a different story. A god appeared unlike any other. In a world of idols, he was spirit. In a world of plenty, he was one. In a world of distant deities symbolized by astronomical bodies, he was personal, approachable, knowable. His name was Yahweh. His people were Jews. Together they documented their history and their relationship. In so doing, these people at the western doorstep of Arabia played a central role in the most telling of all modern tales. Their intersection begins when a young man named Abram left Sin. In a perilous journey, he and his stunning wife Sarai, his father Terah, and his nephew Lot left Ur of the Chaldeans and headed northwest. Crossing along the roof of the Arabian Peninsula, their route carried them along the Euphrates to an outpost called Haran. Here, Abram's father died, but not his father's god. Sin, the moon god of Ur, reigns supreme. Called by a higher source than even the moon and its god, Abram, Sarai, and Lot left for the safety of the mighty river and headed to the land of Canaan, the promised land. In the greatest story ever told, Abram became Abraham, father of nations. He sired Ishmael at ninety by way of his wife's Egyptian maid and in so doing, Abraham gave birth to the seed of Islam. A decade later, the centenarian witnessed the promised miracle birth of Isaac to Sarai, now Sarah. Isaac became the child of destiny, for through him would come all of the prophets and patriarchs, Jacob, Joshua, Moses, David, Solomon, Isaiah, Daniel, Jeremiah, and two millennia later, Yeshua, known to Westerners as Jesus of Nazareth. This biblical story was destined to play out in the crossroads of history, in the most contested land on earth, at the very intersection of continents. Yet these great dramas depicting the rise of civilizations and faiths simply teased the Arabians. The footprints of culture, science, language, religion, law, and the arts were blown away by the Syrian sands. The Chaldeans, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans all intertwined their history with Abraham's descendants through Isaac, but not Ishmael. It was as if the Arabs were on a deserted island, marooned in time. Such was the milieu for Islam, 
a religion so sterile it could only have taken root in a like mind and place. Arabs remained illiterate throughout the millennia, which is why we know so little about them, and it is why they knew so little about the world that engulfed them. Their language was derived from Aramaic, the dominant tongue of history's initial millennia. But Arabic found neither stylus nor pen for one hundred generations. By Muhammad's time, less than one in a hundred Arabians could write. Classical Arabic, the language in which the Quran would come to be written, was just beginning to evolve in Syria. The Bedouins of the Syrian steppe were nomadic by necessity. Their land was too poor to support towns of substance. Arabs, a name derived from the word arid, were tribal peoples. There was never a dominant civilization over them. Most attempts to conquer their peninsula were foiled by the harsh environmental conditions, further exacerbating the challenge of knowing these people. For three thousand years they were neither conquered nor conquerers, for subduing Bedouins was like herding cats. The Babylonians, Assyrians, Egyptians, Persians, Greeks, and Romans all failed. But it was not because the Arabs were savage. They coveted freedom and valued nonviolence. For three millennia of recorded history, Arabs were among the world's most peaceful and self-reliant people. It is only during the past 1,400 years that they have become terrorists. The dividing line was Islam. Muhammad corrupted them. The Islamic scholars try valiantly to paint the pre-Islamic period, called Jahiliya, or period of ignorance, in the worst possible light. They demonize Arabs to make the resulting Islamic society, arguably the most ignorant and brutal in world history, look good by comparison. But what little evidence we have of these people, their lives and customs, indicates that they didn't act foolishly. Unlike their descendants in the 21st century, 7th century Arabs were a free, peace-loving people who cherished family values and honored tribal commitments. Reliant on springs, most nomadic Bedouins provided sustenance by cultivating date palms, herding sheep, working leather, or running caravans. Their parched land was known for hearty camels and wide open spaces. With the rain clouds blocked by the ragged mountains of Syria, Israel, Jordan, and Western Arabia, more often than not the harbingers of life simply teased the land that became Mohammed's. It was these very conditions that made it impregnable. The roads that enabled armies of Babylon, Assyria, Persia, Egypt, Greece, and Rome to conquer and control much of the world were difficult to build and impossible to maintain. And there was no incentive. Virtually nothing of value originated from this barren realm. It only served as a dry ocean to be crossed when carrying goods from producer to consumer. But since the Arabian Peninsula was surrounded by seas and the most vital of rivers, circumnavigating it was always easier than passing through. The land Mohammed coveted was a foreboding wasteland, a place that time had forgotten. Whispers and faint echoes were all Arabs knew of the world surrounding them. Over time they came to hear of the gods of Nimrod and Babylon. Similar gods rose in Egypt, Greece, and Rome. They blended man, beast, and sky into palpable superstitions that elevated rulers to deities. The inventors and keepers of the divine trust, God's co-conspirators and messengers, crafted schemes designed to make their subjects submit, pay, and obey. By the 7th century, Arabs had also heard of the two great monotheistic religions. Stories of the Jews, their patriarch Abraham, and his god Yahweh were commonplace. Moses was known as the great liberator, David and Solomon as kings. Following their captivity in Babylon, many Jews settled in Arabia, especially in the oasis of Yathrib. They told the Bedouins that they were kindred spirits of sorts. The Torah claimed both peoples, Arabs and Jews, were descendants of Abraham. The Arabs traced their lineage through Ishmael, embarrassing in that he was the bastard child of a slave girl. The real heir to Yahweh's covenant was Isaac, born to Abraham's wife Sarah. Innocent enough, such notice would loom large. The nomads of Arabia knew something of Christianity, which by the 6th century was the most pervasive